I ran up the stairs and there was literally just like a man, a dead man, lying on a, lying. And I remember seeing him and I, I screamed. I was so scared. That was my first experience of seeing a dead body. It's very rewarding. I come home and say I've had a great day at work. People think that I've just, I love dead people. 50% say, oh, tell me more, it's such, so interesting. And then the other 50% say, oh, okay. And then they just casually walk away. They don't want to catch, catch any death. Do people poop when they pass away? Yes, sorry. Um. I grew up in the funeral and crematorium world. That was my, my normal, I guess. My father was always working in that. I heard about death from a young age. Uh, I heard really gruesome stories, but I also learned to appreciate life very early on and how fragile and short it is. <laughs> Relatively normal, uh, middle suburbia family from Queensland. Mum, dad, sister, yeah, pretty standard to be honest. Middle class family, Sydney based, moved down the coast when I was early teens and just done all my schooling there. I was born and raised in South Africa. My mother was a career woman and my father was a military man. Um, and my mum left when I was a young teenager, so I've pretty much been supporting myself and been independent since a very young age. So I went into marketing and communications and worked for several years across the advertising and gambling industries. Decided that, that was a little bit soulless, I guess. Saw an ad come up for a funeral home manager on Seek, um, applied and was successful. After several years as a location home manager, I received a promotion to operations manager. So now I'm the operations manager in Brisbane, where we look after a new um, big InvoCare support centre, which manages up to 150 deceased and we have over 45 staff on site. It is the biggest funeral operations centre in the state. I sent the application randomly thinking that'd be interesting, like you'd probably come up with some cool stories doing that. So I applied, completely forgot about the application and kept on living and then they called me and they, I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> come in for an interview. So I went in had the interview and said, look, like, I haven't done anything like this before, like I'm good at talking with people. Again, not once have I spoke to anyone grieving or mourning the death of a loved one, but I'm ready and willing to give anything a go. I actually wrote a little love letter to the funeral industry. I printed it out, put it in envelopes and walked over the whole of my town and handed this love letter in person to every funeral home. And eventually uh, someone decided to give me a shot. It was me talking about how beautiful the industry is and how important the industry is and, and how much value it has to the community and how much I wanted to be a part of that community. Even if it's just getting a foot in the door, it didn't matter to me what role I was given, but once you're in, you know, that's, that's all that matters. So I was just looking to get my foot in the door. I was in year nine, I just started a new school, I was at a private girls' school, and I remember seeing this, this photographer from the newspaper came to our house and took like a photo of us as a family. It was me, my mother, my father, and my younger sister. And it was like all talking about, oh, this is what my dad does, and this is his family, and you know, he's a, there's only one funeral home in my hometown, right? So everyone knows each other, it's a small community. And I remember reading it in year nine, so I was like, 15, 14, I don't know. But I remember being like, why is this in the newspaper? It's so weird, like everyone else's dad, I haven't seen their whole family in a newspaper talking about this this work. And the, re the reaction I get when I tell people, I could tell it's unique and different. So definitely it's a little, a little weird. <laughs> so I grew up right near it. So like in the school holidays, I would be hanging out at a funeral. <laughs> and I remember running up, I didn't know there was a body so I was quite young, I was a child, and I didn't actually, you know, no one told me there was a body upstairs, and for some reason I ran up the stairs, I was in, in a certain area, near the morgue, and I ran up the stairs, and there was literally just like a man, a dead man, lying on a, lying, and I remember seeing him, and I, I screamed. I was so scared, and I was like, oh my God, and I ran down and told my father, and that was my first experience of seeing a dead body. Um, one that I really sticks with me was a lady who, had lost her husband and he was 93. So he had a really long life. They were madly in love. He passed away holding her hand on the couch. And I remember being at the burial site and her just wailing and 
that sound will never leave me. Um, so it wasn't about that he died young or died tragically, he didn't. Um, he was surrounded by a lot of love. It was that love that I will remember um, and definitely will stay with me. I had this family that I was caring for and their grief, the, the loss was really sudden and their grief was so profound and I almost felt like oh no, I don't know how to help, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to help this family. I felt so unprepared. I felt like I didn't have the skills to manage all this high energy in the room. But I started to learn that you're not there to fix the problem. You're there to do a job and that's to put together a really beautiful fa uh, funeral for this family. And you have a purpose, you have a job to do. Uh, no one wants your sympathy. You can have empathy for them, but they're not interested in your sympathy. They just want you to do your best and put together something really, really beautiful and memorable. First experience I had, they just brought us into the, the body fridge and said, okay, like pretty much, do you want to see a dead body? <laughs> um, so we did, we, we unzipped the body bag, rolled it back and there was an elderly woman laying there. My, at least my first few times was you're staring at them and you keep expecting to see their chest move or for them to blink or move or something. It took me a while to sort of stop expecting to see movement, I guess, if that makes any sense. You just sort of keep looking in the corner of your eye or just, I don't know, just interesting to sort of see a deceased person. If you haven't seen many before, going straight to multiple daily, it, yeah, the first few times. Is definitely interesting. A lot of people in the general Australian public um, get, I suppose, some of their information about the funeral industry from American TV shows, which doesn't actually make it relevant here in Australia. So if someone passes away um, in a car accident or through a murder or really kind of horrific circumstances, in Australia, it's the, not the paramedics that come and pick up the deceased or the police, it's actually funeral directors. So we are the first people on the scene when there is clearly a deceased person involved. The funeral industry doesn't get involved until your loved one has passed. So we don't have much experience with, with what that process looks like for the individual, you know, passing away and, and dying. But we do have experience on, on caring for your loved one once they've passed. Most of the time we will get the phone call either from you as the loved one or, or from the hospital. We jump in our van, we load up the stretchers, the body bags, head out to the address. We don't know what we're going to walk into so we go out, knock on the door, we go in, see what we're sort of dealing with, come out to the van, sort of reassess the situation with our teammate and then head on in with the rest of our gear and the whole process from like getting the call to having them back into our facility probably takes about two hours. Once we're back, they go into our body fridge and then they go through the mortuary process where they get washed, dressed, placed into a coffin and then we get them ready for their day of their funeral. So within that time they go through their arrangement, talk to our rangers and they plan everything they want to happen on the day, where they want it, orders of service, memorial books, what music, who's doing the slideshow, where do you want your flowers, all that sort of, I guess, funerally stuff. And then my job, I come back into it and get the crew ready for the day. We load up the hearse with the body and then head out to the funeral, make sure everything goes well and they're either buried or cremated and that's really the end of that. <laughs> um, still to this day, from my friends, I get so many questions and people are super curious. Some people are freaked the fuck out. They're like, I don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear about the dead bodies you've seen. We don't want to hear about the weird smells you can smell upstairs. Like, we don't want to know. And then I, then I get like people that want to do it. They're like, oh, can, like, can you help me get a job in this field? And I'm like, are you sure? Can you choose what, you, what outfit you want to wear for your funeral? I get, um, oh, like, why aren't you freaked out? Like, isn't that scary? Don't you think like a spirit is going to like come out and get you sometimes? Like if you're into that, that stuff. What do dead bodies smell like? I get what color? Is the skin, what does the skin look like? People are really obsessed with like physical appearances of dead bodies and I'm like, well it just feels like it's surface level. It just feels like it's really superficial. Oh, holy dooly, there's a few. So um, one would be do we cremate people together? Like how do we know? 
the ashes of mum. So our wonderful cremator operators and the crematoriums and cemetery teams um, have really kind of honed in on making sure we track efficiently and effectively. Everyone by law is cremated on their own um, and that process is quite strict on what that looks like. So you're definitely getting your nana back in that urn, I promise. Things like, do you have people sit up or open their eyes um, while in the mortuary? Typically, everyone already has their eyes open. So when you pass away, the muscles will relax, which means your mouth and eyes traditionally will open. So we've got some handy little tips and tricks to close them. So that doesn't surprise us when someone's got their eyes open in mortuary. It just means they typically haven't been prepped yet. Do people poop when they pass away? Yes, sorry. Um, our operations centre there in Queensland is also completely run by women. So I myself, then we have our mortuary manager, our regional manager, our general manager, and even our national general manager of funerals are all women. Um, I work with a bunch of women. Everyone has different experiences through life to draw from. Um, some of them have 30, 40 years experience. Some of them like me are just fairly fresh. Everyone's able to bring something to the table or to the team to make it all work better. My friends sit in kind of um, like two major groups. So first, do not want to know. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want me to talk about it. The others ask you, what's the weirdest thing I've seen? What's the grossest thing I've seen? What's the grossest thing I've smelled? Most of them are really um, can't think of why I would ever want to do this or that's absolutely mad. It's 50% down the line, 50% say, oh, tell me more, it's such, so interesting. And then the other 50% say, oh, okay. And then they just don't want to make eye contact with you and they casually walk away. They don't want to catch, catch any death. So it really depends on who you're speaking to. A couple of cases, my first suicide victim was a young gentleman, 17 years, who had hung himself. I learnt that day in the mortuary on how to hide ligature marks using lipstick and concealer. Um, I met with his mum and how devastated she was and that I genuinely couldn't do anything to bring her little boy back. I had looked after a young 10 year old little boy who had died from cancer where I had brought him into our care from where he passed away at his family home. and. I can still hear in my mind uh, his mum screaming out for me not to take him. And that was probably one of the hardest days that I've had um, as ever, because I had a son at the same age and I would be in the same circumstance is she didn't want to let him go, I didn't want to take him, but the circumstances that led me there meant that I had to. So the care that we provided both of those people um, was at the highest quality, but it still hurts. Um, and I wouldn't be human, I suppose, if those particular cases don't stay with me. Um, but once again, it's about taking on board that grief, parking it to the sign, so that I can help the family manage the grief that they are owed. The toughest moment for me is the unexpected death, the suicide, the children, um, people that felt like there was no other way but to kill themselves. I would say that mental illness, COVID-19 didn't help any of that. Um, I was at work one morning and I got a phone call and I, you know, you kind of get used, it sounds bad, but you get used to like the aged care home, old people dying. You're kind of like, okay, they were old, they died. It's the ones that are like, hey, we just, we just found like a 20 year old man who shot himself with like his dad's rifle in the head in a, on a property in a car and it's like, I don't think we're talking enough about mental health and mental Ill men's mental health and mental illness in these areas. That's what's tough for me. It's the young people that feel like they have no other option but to kill themselves. I try my best to be professional when I'm meeting families. Sometimes I would help organise the funeral. I meet them in like a meeting room and I'm like, don't cry, don't cry, Monique. Like you have to be professional, take the emotion out of it. And I think there's a thing being like, I'm a woman as well. So it's like, I'm naturally, I'm gonna have that compassion and emotion, but it's, it's, I can still take the emotion out of it, but I leave and I'm like, I'm choking. I've got triplet sons, two years old. They were born at 26 weeks. Uh, we spent eight months in intensive care. The first burial I went on was for a baby born at 26 weeks. And 
instantly. Like they said, do you want to go on the service? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Like if I can help out any way I can, I will. That was tough, uh, but everything went perfectly. It was great. We were able to provide that service for the family. Again, be there for someone when they're in need. Um, that was tough, but it went great. It's funny when coronavirus hit, we were all in the industry really worried it would create significant increase, but actually it had the opposite effect on death toll. So in Queensland, the death rate due to coronavirus in those early years actually went down because people weren't getting into motor vehicle accidents. The elderly weren't passing away from the flu. People weren't getting respiratory illnesses that they would have gotten if they'd come in contact with people. So by using sanitizer, masking up and keeping distance, it actually increased the general population's life significantly. Even though we did see a number of coronavirus cases, it probably leveled out with the death rate that we would have seen traditionally. You know, that changed over time, of course, as people stopped being distant and stopped wearing masks and stopped using hand sanitizer, but of course, coronavirus still exists. So it's interesting to see how that has continued, but certainly in the early days, a significant decrease in the death rate, for sure. People are scared to tell me to have a good day at work. <laughs> they think that I'm going to funerals every day, I must be so sad, like uh, five or six funerals a day, and we still have a lunch break, we still sort of shoot the shit with our mates. We still have a laugh, we still have a joke. Um, you still obviously can be professional and respectful. People think that it's all doom and gloom. Um, even with, you get some new guys coming into the crew and with me, I was a bit timid going up and talking to mourners. They're just people. You can still go up and say, hey, how are you? The answer might be, oh, it's a very bad day. <laughs> but you can still go up and have a normal conversation with these people. Um, people think it's gross. A lot of the times it, I guess, can be, but at the end of the day, you're doing something good. I come home and say I've had a great day at work. People think that I've just, I love dead people. That's probably the biggest one, is people think that it's all sad, and it's not. Coffins are one of the more expensive costs when it comes to arranging a funeral. And so frequently, people would say, yeah, but, but can't we rent one? You know, you, you're gonna reuse it tomorrow for the next person anyway, so why are we spending so much money on this? And they really believe that it's, you know, we, we re recycle coffins, um, where of course you purchase a coffin for your loved one, that is their final bed, they don't leave it. Whether they're buried or cremated, um, that coffin belongs to them. A lot of people assume that you need to be embalmed. Embalming is not necessary in all situations. Of course, if you're going to be repatriated or if you're going to go on a long drive or a flight or if you're going to be buried in an above ground vault, um, certain things like that, there are restrictions around um, embalming and, and people have to be embalmed. But outside of that, here in Australia, it's, it's not as common as people think. I know that we've held on to ashes for many, 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 many years. Um, I think it's, it's a bit of a stalemate because you can't discard them, but we, we try everything to, to get the family to collect their loved one. But it's surprising how sometimes people will be okay through the funeral process, and then when it's time to collect their loved one's ashes, they, that, that sometimes is, is the most difficult part. I think it's very, very final, so um, we'll always do our best to make sure your loved one comes back home to you. We have to do a stock take of our ashes, right? Kind of like retail, you need to do a stock take of clothing or whatever you're doing. We, we have a cupboard full of ashes, it's next to the cremator. We need to make sure people are being collected, right? We can't hold people for years. And I'm going through the stock take and I'm marking off the names and I, I see like a, I see a box right at the back of the cupboard and I'm like, okay, who's this? And I, I reach in and I pull it out. And it's so old, I can't even really read the label, like who, who it is. I have no idea who it is, I'm reading it. I end up working out who it is by the database and everything. And I work out, it's a man from the 1940s. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like no one came to get you. I'll look up your family. I look up his family, no one's alive. There's no one to come and get him. And I'm thinking, what the fuck do I do? And I had to speak to one of the directors and I was like, I, I can't really, I feel like I can't leave him in the cupboard. 
I was like, I'm going to do something. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I'm not going to throw him out. I'm not going to throw him in the rubbish or whatever it is. I'm not going to do that. That's so wrong. And I was like, I'm going to actually give him like a send off. I'm going to, I'm going to put him in a garden. I'm going to release him. I picked the garden. I spoke to one of the directors. He walked out with me. I carried him in my arms and I, I like was talking to him on the way. I kind of wanted him to feel a connection and like, it's going to be okay. And I've been in here for so long. I'm going to release you. And yeah, we, I released him into the into the garden and I think it was such a weird moment that no one came to collect him, like 1940s. And I don't know how we missed that in stock take. Like I don't know why, maybe no one wanted to deal with it and they were like whatever and just like put him at the back. But you know, he's out now, he's in the monumental garden. So we've had people be buried in a furry costume. So part of the furry community. The funeral was super interesting, I'll be honest. Uh, but fabulous all the same. We've done wonderful um, funerals in nightclubs, in really fantastic nightclubs. We've done nighttime services, which have been champagne on arrival. We've done services in people's homes. We've done services where we've had people put into fireworks or tattoos or blown up, um, made into diamonds. So it really is, as long as it's legal, we will find a way to do it. I didn't expect there to be as many upbeat funerals as there are. One of my training days, they just had us watch like funeral services that they had recorded over time. And they had this one where there was a young guy that died of some kind of cancer. And the funeral had went on and everything. And then out of nowhere, there was this drag queen that come bursting into the aisleway, singing some show tune to all the crowd. And it was a big surprise for everyone in the audience, but. I just couldn't imagine being there, obviously crying and upset and everything, and, and just having this drag queen come around and just sing at you, like feather, the full thing, like feathers, confetti. It was awesome. Um, the fact that the people planned that for a funeral, it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, you do get some bangers. You definitely get some good music, and it's great. Like, you crank it up and like, we've had Nine Inch Nails and everything. Like, you name it, people will pick it. If you sort of read the crowd, if it's like a, elderly lady that's passed away and you thought we'll keep it at a respectful level so it's not blowing out eardrums. Um, a lot of the funerals I conduct for the younger people, the crowd's generally a bit more receptive to I guess louder music and if it's a good song I've got no problem turning it all the way up like let's crank it like let's make them hear it all the way up there. We actually did a funeral and it didn't feel like a funeral and it was a it was a it was a woman who died and her song was like that Bruno, I'm happy. It was like a celebration and she had balloons. And it was like, I don't feel, I feel like I'm at a birthday party. I was like, I don't feel like I'm at a funeral. And I don't think she wanted anyone to be sad. Like let's reshape funerals. The word fun is in funeral. I always think about that. F-U-N, fun, is in the word funeral. And I'm like, no one talks about that. I always think of that word and I'm like, but the first three letters are spelling fun. I think my perspective's changed in regards to how I choose to, to use my days, where before I think perhaps that's even a symptom of being youthful is, you know, I've got so many days, I'm just going to lay in bed this day and, you know, you, ju you, don't, you don't think about the fact that those days you can't get back. So I definitely make the most of, of my days. We really get a unique perspective that a majority of the general public don't get. It's really sobering to see people my own age um, pass away and then in turn that really makes me appreciate the fact that I am in good health, that I do have a wonderful support system inside work and out and what that means. Um, you know, I really do think that Growing old is a gift not everyone receives, so I'm really trying to take it on board as best as I can and grow comfortably and confidently into the future. I wouldn't say it's changed my opinion on death, but it makes you think about the actual physical process differently. Not long after I started, I started thinking of my own funeral and what would it be like and I wonder who's going to be there and what would I want to sort of happen and then you don't even think about, oh, I'm going to be dead. Like, I'm um, not even going to be there, really. Um, it makes you think about religion. We work with a lot of churches. All have different ideas about what happens after you go. Take your pick. Um, who's right? <laughs> I wouldn't say my outlook on death has changed. 
Um, I think I'm just a lot more used to it now. Like I said, a lot closer to it than I was before. You know what, I'm gonna say this, I'm not scared of death now. Um, I think most people are scared of death. I think it's normal, I used to be scared of death. But I've seen, now I'm not, I don't know. It feels like I've realized it's just so natural. Like it's just so normal. It would be weird if we didn't die. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's like a, an evolution, it's a cycle. And it's really beautiful because you know, the thing about death is when you die, you know that there's always gonna be life coming after you like a rebirth. And it's like, do we ever die though? That's, that's how I think now. Are we ever, do we actually die? That's the thing, we die physically, our body dies. But do we ever die? Because our memory will live on on earth to the people that we affected and our spirit will live on and we were here, like we made our mark, we were here. So I don't know if we ever do die.